or my paper is titled uh, Transgenerational Transmission of Romani Scales in Klenovets and Kukela. Uh, this uh, research is actually part of my PhD research and I've just literally started my field work, well, like, I would say like a week ago. Uh, but my PhD research is actually following up on my MA research, which I conducted since 2013 and mostly in 2015. So I'm going to present some kind of, um, you know, older outcomes from, uh, from older ethnographic data. So this is like a stupid map for those who are for the first time in, uh, in Central Europe, possibly. And there's another map on the other side, other slide, where you can, for those who are more familiar with uh, Slovak geography, you can see Banská Bystrica, <laughs> and here, in the middle of nowhere, basically, two in inconspicuous town, both about 3,000 inhabitants, Klenovec uh, and Kokava and Rimaveco. Now, why I have chosen this uh, this music community is that uh, there is very vivid tradition of Romani musicianships that is popular not just within uh, the region and Slovakia, but also worldwide, as you can see here. Uh, so meet Vlad Sandrej, musician from Kokava, meet Janka Sandrejova, a singer from Kokava, his wife, and would anyone recognize this gentleman here in the center? I think it's been mentioned already in the previous presentation. Would anyone recognize him? No, it's not Timothy Rice, but he looks like Timothy Rice, that's true. So any, any more suggestions? Yes, it's Hans Zimmer himself, a uh, famous soundtrack maker. I guess uh, that everyone has heard at least the name. And uh, the reason why this gentleman is kissing this lady's uh, hand is basically what, what's been also mentioned in the previous uh, presentation. Uh, because these uh, musicians from, uh, from uh, Kokava, they, um, they participated for making something, which is on the other side. It's beautiful. What's up to the, the wall? Oh, lovely. Uh, so these gentlemen uh, made uh, or not made, but participated in making uh, something to film uh, Sherlock Holmes and Game of Shadows in, made in 2012. Now, um, there's one more stunning thing about this picture, and that is that, with one only exception, none of these guys here has any music education. And when I first came from the field, I asked, and this is going to be another slide, how is that possible? How is it possible that these people obviously achieve the, the highest level of music education, of music aptitude, and they don't have any music education? And when I came uh, from the field, and uh, I was telling this incredible story to everyone, you know, I'm an amazing musician, and none of them has any music education. And the most common answer was, they must have it in their blood. <laughs> because by education, I'm a social cultural anthropologist, I said, come on, it's not possible, you can't have music in your blood. And they say, yeah, you're right, you got to have music in your blood, but they certainly do, there's no other explanation. <laughs> so I started digging into this topic a little bit more. Uh, so when I rephrase the question in a very simple way, uh, I rephrase it as follows. How do the musicians from Planets and Kokava become top-level musicians with no music education? What was, for me, most suspicious thing about this claim, or this question, is this last part. Yes, with no music education. Uh, I will try to explain a little bit more. On the following slide, there is a um, quotation from a very famous anthropological book, uh, Melville J. Herskovitz's 1948 Thoughts About Enculturation. As you see, he defined education as a learning system that includes both formal and informal way of acquiring some skills, while he also defined schooling as this part of the educational system that is carried out on specific times in particular places outside home for definite periods of life and by persons especially prepared or trained for the task. Now on, on the next slide there is a quotation from another famous uh, book, well, I guess you probably know Anthropology of Music, 1964, Marion. He said exactly this, lack of schooling is not equal to lack of education, that is, lack of formal institution in no way suggests that education in its broadest sense is absent. And therefore, I rephrase my, uh, my question or my problem in a completely different way. What if there is no such thing as uh, natural ab abilities that are being inherited from generations to another? What if there is indeed some different kind of educational system that no one has actually described? And what if this system is in the same level, but, but significantly different from European system of, uh, of music education? And what if this system, uh, honest, their musicality in completely different ways? What do you think? So, I actually, in 2015, I went uh, to the field with 
the aim to, to kind of discover or uh, describe this, uh, this educational system, this supposed educational system. And yeah, to the next few slides and next few minutes uh, are going to be dedicated to this uh, educational system, which is going to be described uh, with a comparison to standardized system of music education in Slovakia. I said in Slovakia, but uh, I've, I've found also some similarities in the Czech Republic and, uh, and elsewhere in Europe. So for those who are outside this area, you can actually make kind of mental exercise and try to think about the uh, educational system in your country and try to think whether it, it fits also. So I will be arguing that there are two different kind of aims for an educational system. I will also be arguing that these two aims uh, provide different educational methods and these educational methods, finally, they shape completely different aim music skills. So let's start with the music aims. I will argue that the ultimate aim of something that I call standardized system of musical education in Slovakia is exactly this, performing classical music. All the educational system is designed so that eventually, if you, if you become the top high-level musician, you will be sitting here in an orchestra. So this is uh, this is the ultimate aim of uh, I, I see some disagreement. I will very much looking forward to, to to some comments on that. Uh, while the aims that, uh, of the educational system that I was trying to describe, yes, is maximizing profit from music maker. And what I mean by maximizing profit, it's first of all, it's um, both social and uh, cultural profit, uh, not just economical. This is a uh, this is Romani proverb that I've heard in Glenovitz. If you don't want to be hungry, marry a musician. This indicates, and it's, it indeed works like this in, uh, in my field, that the musicians, especially the professional musicians that has made some, some uh, you know, sources of money out of music making, they are indeed uh, supposed to be a aristocracy of, of uh, the local communities, and they are they live in much higher standards, generally speaking. Also, it means that the repertoire is being constructed basically for the paying audience. There's no such thing as, uh, you know, authentic or traditional Romani music in my field. What is important and what matters is who's going to listen and who's going to pay. And last but not least, as for the aim uh, for maximizing um, this making, the musicians are actually being judged not only how fast he can play, how, how many songs does he know, but about this, uh, it's, it's all about this, it's how much he can earn. Uh, yeah, I, I, and maybe I make one side note, you've noticed that I say he, I, I don't say he or she, and that's because uh, it's, this educational system is super strictly male domain. So, now let's move to uh, this, to educational methods. And there's a whole list uh, I, I could describe, so I just like picked up the most significant and most notable things. So first, there's, uh, it's already been a little bit mentioned, there we go, that Romani traditional methods of musical teaching and learning are highly informal and there's a greater emphasis on indirect <coughs> learning. That means that most of the teaching activities or activities that uh, you, you know, you during which you acquire some music skills are not like uh, settings that we are used to. That there's teacher, there's people, it takes uh, specific time, it, uh, if it's going on uh, specific places, and so on. So, actually, you can see uh, quotation here. Uh, when there is such setting, and I ask, okay, so, so they have a teacher. So, did they pay to the teacher? And the answer is no, they didn't. In fact, they didn't teach them, they were just playing together with him. So you can see there's a completely different approach towards uh, this formality. Mm -hmm. The next thing I, I would like to mention, the uh, next difference, would be, this is drawing from uh, Van den Bosch's uh, theory, which is uh, actually like a kind of nice theory, and uh, unfortunately I, I will not have time to, to go too much to the detail, but he pointed out something that is called analytic approach, sorry, sorry, oh. Oh, sorry. <laughs> on this side, and concentric, uh, sorry, holistic approach on, on this side. And drawing from this theory, he argues that there's something he calls linear curriculum. That means that you basically play uh, linear, the, the repertoire is linear, and it's con constructed by methodologies, and it's so-called pedagogical repertoire. It's, um, you simply said, you simply said, simply said you start with simple song, and you go into a moderate song, and eventually you play Chopin. Now, why is that? It's because the, the system is linear. 
while he, on the other side, and I would argue that the uh, Romani system of music uh, education is completely co concentric, that is, they actually don't start with simple songs just for the sake of you know, playing simple songs and eventually they would move towards a uh, more complex song. But, uh, but rather, what they do, they start with the real repertoire that is being played and that, that they actually want to play. And of course, they, they can't play it as a master for the first time. So they eventually um, you know, play with mistakes and play without mistakes. Then they put in some more advanced thread of uh, music performance, some ornamentation, and so on. This is what, what is called concentric curriculum. <laughs> if you actually play a repertoire that, that you like and not the repertoire that was constructed by some methodologies, you might end up being super addicted to, to music. You know, you, you don't really measure time that you spend with your instrument, as you can see on the quotation here uh, from one of my research participants. And, yes, there we go. Uh, one of the last thing I would like to mention as for educational method is this. It's very obvious, but still I need to mention it, that the standardized system is strictly transmitted through notes, through reading notes from, from sheets of music, while on the other side, uh, only uh, oral transmission and, and learning through imitation, it's, uh, it's common, it's not way. So, now, what does it mean in terms of gain skills? So, first skill I'd like to introduce, um, again, this, this could be potentially an uh, endless list, but I will introduce just three uh, differences, three most notable things. Is this accuracy, which is very typical. If you need to play in an orchestra, you need to be accurate. You need to play precisely what is in your in your sheet of music, otherwise you are fired. While here, you rather, on the other side, you kind of use the tune as a raw material and you personalize it, as you can see on the quotation here. Basically, the, if, if you don't deal with uh, the tune as, as, as something which is, which is uh, not supposed to be changed, but rather with something that is supposed to be ornamentated, you end up uh, having more, it's opening space for improvisation. So that's first thing. Then, second thing is uh, obviously this reading notes, because if you need to play in an orchestra, you need to read notes, and if you, because it would obviously take time for musicians if they would need to listen and learn by heart, so notes are a great skill. While none of my participants, or very few uh, of my research participants know or knew how to read a note, which can seem as like a huge disadvantage. But on the other hand, they have a skill that I call key mobility, that is an ability to play in whatever key. Now, what, what does it mean practically? Here you can see uh, another uh, nice Romani saying that you are not a musician if you're not able to play a song in any key. And I guess there are some musicians, some of you know, that some keys are easy to play, some keys are more difficult to play, some keys are very unpleasant to be played, right? And for them it doesn't make much difference, and on the other hand it's very useful skill for such events, such, I don't know, weddings. Imagine that you are uh, in a wedding and all of a sudden someone starts singing in E flat major out of tune, and you need to accompany this person, no matter what's, what's going to happen. So this is actually quite a useful skill that's also developed specifically for uh, in this educational system. Last thing I would like to mention is this uh, adaptability skill. Uh, what I mean by adaptability versus formalized cooperation, because this part of the because uh, it's supposed to create particular harmony because the composer wrote it as such. While here you can you need to be first and foremost adaptable. This is kind of a long story, but to make this long story on the slide very short. It's a, it's a story that uh, some of my research participants, they played song that they have never heard before. This is, I think, something unique that, that not many musicians can, can actually do to play a song that they have never even heard. And they obviously earn 50 euros for it. Um, yeah, so that's about it. I think this, is, uh, this slide basically summarizes everything what I have said so far. And if, you, if the letters are too small, you can also visit this, uh, this link and you will find more information about the research. And that's about it. Uh, thanks for your attention. I'll be looking forward to your uh, questions and comments. Thank you very much.
pedagogical uh, principles where music is learned by the Roma, but naturally, it's not, not only by the Roma, but by others too, but naturally, he really is interested to uh, try to reconstruct what is going on in this society. And because they are very near to music, and there are other uh, ask problems and um, uh, which they have to handle. Yeah. So, thank you very much. Please, questions. Please. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about the uh, Romany side of the equation. Uh, not so much the foil, which I think is a little overdrawn. But um, can you tell me a little bit more about um, sort of like apprentice, apprenticeship process, perhaps? What, what, when do the what children begin playing with uh, the good bands? Um, and what are their roles as they begin? And what, how do they change as they grow older? Uh, what do they learn at different stages, and do they move through different musical roles in the ensemble, change instruments, things like that? Yeah. Thanks. I'll try without microphone. Would it work for everyone? Okay, great. Uh, so, uh, it's a nice question, but very much depends on what type of music you enjoy playing. So, I think what is really key for, for their success is early music experience. Basically, most of them uh, start perceiving music very early in their childhood. And what also is uh, what really plays a significant role is uh, musician families. Mm -hmm. so if you are born into music, music families, there is like a ritual that you, are, that you may uh, very early in your childhood is uh, taking bow, and obviously you are you know baby child, so you always take something that mm -hmm. they, and you, you see he's gonna be a musician, mm -hmm. and therefore you are really forced, and it's it's not it's about forcing, it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, not about us. You be a musician, we will take care of you. But because uh, it really, uh, it's really good and convenient in, in this context to be musician, economically speaking, mm -hmm. you are really being forced into it. Uh, I heard stories that some of uh, my research participants were asked, uh, no, 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 father, I don't want to be a musician, I want to be a bodybuilder. And he was getting beaten until he finally <laughs> agreed to, be, uh, to continue his, uh, his career of, uh, of being a musician. So, uh, so this is the first thing. And then uh, it pretty much depends on uh, on yourself, on what, what genre you, you prefer. And uh, it's about constant training and constant trying different things. And also, this really matters for, for the rest of your music life. Because uh, I have no story that some guys play double bass, which is good for folk music. But it's not as good for uh, contemporary economical situation in Central Slovakia. Mm -hmm. Because they wouldn't dare to pay a uh, thousand euros for all Sigmalum band. They run play like, 150 euros for someone with keyboard mm -hmm. and therefore they're switching to where it's you know something that is more easy to carry and easy to play and getting more money out of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, it was very very nice uh, analysis. And I just want to uh, say again some example. Gypsy musicians in Transylvania are many, many families, and usually the way is that the little guy, as soon as he can reach to the contrabass, he starts to play the contrabass. Then after a while he turns to the contra, contra violin, and then he becomes pretty much. And the other thing which you mentioned that you don't learn it somehow, you, you have it in the blood. Even an old bagpiper, a jungle bagpiper in 93, we uh, wanted to revitalize the bagpipe tradition in Moldavia. So I, we made a new bagpipe for the old man who was an excellent bagpiper but didn't have the instrument anymore. He started to play and to my happiness, a young guy, 18 years old, he begged to learn it. So I asked the old man, please, teach this guy, he will come over the, the mountain, and indeed he did. But the third time, when, when he heard the third time, that, what do you want to learn it? I'm sorry, you have to born with that. <laughs> you know, so it is difficult. He was not a gypsy musician, but I think it is true about many folk musicians, they don't remember those times when they had to fight. They believe that they are born with that. So you mentioned these two things, uh, and I would agree with the, the latest mention that was the self-identification with the myth. It actually works so well for, for uh, Romani musicians that actually, yeah, I believe, 
I am the chosen one because I am Gypsy or I'm Roma. Therefore, uh, you yeah, am able to play music and not, not you gadgets. You come on, I don't know, you know. And this actually works as a kind of positive, um, how to put it, uh, like a po positive influence in uh, shaping your musicality or your musical talent. You just trust yourself more. You know, I'm, I'm Roma. I have talent. I don't have to do much. Also, the non-Romas are leaving this. The Roma people are all Lamarckian thinking. You know that you are born as a talented musician, and certainly, or you learn the music, and certainly you uh, pass it through through your gene, which is not natural, but it is strong. You also mentioned the other thing, which is quite interesting, which is that you said that in Romania they go from double bass, which is struggling for me because that's a little bit for double bass, but, in, but whatever, yeah. uh, to viola to pretty much. So in my field, I've noticed that it's more about uh, an opportunity. So if there's an instrument in family that no one can play, someone, for example, dies, it's being said to the youngest kid or the, the kid that is in the age group that he or she, say, he is supposed to play an instrument. And yeah. Yeah, that's about, yeah, that's about. Thank you very much, Peter. Great performance and very, very clear uh, system. When I started uh, to write on a learning and teaching process in European folk music traditions 20 years ago, there was really very, very few uh, literature. So this is really a great uh, process. Um, of course, I think Professor Enschek is right. Uh, ma many things uh, from the right side are also typical for non gypsy or Romani um, the communities, with one uh, exception. The proverb, if you want to be rich, marry a musician. <laughs> so many uh, songs uh, about uh, European folk musicians tell exactly about the opposite. Uh, he is always, uh, always poor, never marry a musician. Uh, this is an interesting point. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes? So <laughs> bad. That's what Tim Rice actually also writes, uh, writes about sugar and big wipers, isn't it? Precisely, precisely. So, thank you very much for your interesting paper. Um, for me, uh, being a musician um, in, in, in my music band uh, for more than 40 years, it's really something very interesting and uh, very inspiring. But, and sorry for uh, simplifying. If you uh, imagine that you are born in a Roma musician family, you also know that your uh, whole family survives from music, for playing music. Your descendants used to be from music, etc. So, which means that within uh, your family, not just repertoire, technical skills, etc., but also the whole know-how is being tra transmitted. Uh, that's why, uh, in my opinion, uh, financial motivation, and sorry, this is the art of simplification, Simplification is the best learning and, 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 and teaching motivation. Uh, you said uh, the musicians they are uh, able to play all the keys and all, yeah? all, all, all the keys, yeah. But don't forget, please, uh, because here in this country, until the 60s of the last uh, century, the musicians, the Roma musicians, when they were supposed to play the weddings, no money, no honor uh, was fixed. They went to play at weddings just for money. They end uh, during a very important phase of the wedding, and namely when the, all the wedding uh, guests were sitting around the table, and everybody could order as if his or her own song. You know, and that's why nevertheless, if they uh, were thinking in in what uh, any in any case, you know, the veil, they they must do it because otherwise they, they couldn't get any honor any money. This is the motivation, um, actually, I'm, I'm talking about, you know? And then, uh, well, of course, uh, you were talking, it was also very interesting what kind of differences uh, they have in their families, whether it's formal or informal. Imitation, uh, repeating, repetitions, etc., and being involved in real, uh, with real repertoire and in real uh, situations and opportunities. I think it, it, it works everywhere and yeah, also in the past as well as in the present. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much for an inspiring presentation. I apologize so for my English. I I will try to ask or put my question or or rather remark as precise as possible. Uh, I'm thinking all the time about the adjective Romani here. Uh, you started uh, with uh, with data you gained in one certain uh, research locality uh, that is Klanovets and Kukala and Marico. And when I uh, like read uh, those terms uh, mentioned in the second, uh, like on the on the right, I met already musicians, for example, uh, from around Rimalska Sobota. They uh, they uh, they really uh, <laughs> uh, are. Uh, should be put on, rather on the left side when we speak about uh, a few terms. Uh, I know m much more examples uh, of musicians playing in string bands, cymbal bands, that they do not fit in this uh, uh, right uh, stripe of uh, terms. Uh, so my question would be, uh, to what degree uh, the adjective room, uh, uh, like, or what, to what degree do you think that this model is applicable to all Roman musicians' community? Because our discussion, uh, I'm sorry, this, this discussion shows that we are speaking generally about, about the Roman musicians right now. Yes, thank you. This is a really crucial uh, question. And actually, uh, at the end of 2015, I think the was actually concluding, I, I, I didn't have time to, to put this conclusion here as well, that this, what I call traditional, which is the most promiscuous uh, anthropological and ethnomusicological <laughs> word in, in uh, the world, I think, is actually on the verge of change. It's changing. And one of the change that, that I was suggesting is that these two systems are actually blurring together. Because today, if you are born in a musician-like family, and you are really, you know, this is like crucial, uh, music family like uh, Radiechowski, for example, that, that he... And was he Radiechowski? Was he? Was he? Oh, right, I see. Yeah, okay, okay. So, uh, what they do, they uh, simply say, okay, you are a musician, you are obviously you have in your blood, so, but you need to take an advantage of this as well. So, you know, grab your violin and go to Hrushja, which is a nearby town, and learn something in music school as well, so that you know how to read notes, so that you are ahead of the other musicians. So, indeed, and, and these guys are neither this nor this, because they, they are basically influenced by both educational systems. They are being taught orally, without no transmission, by their uncles, by their fathers, and so on. And they are also taught classical, uh, you know, music school curriculum, let's say. And therefore, at the end, there is very kind of unique uh, mix of these systems, and, and these guys are glad they are really brilliant musicians because they can read notes, but they can also improvise. They they have the scheme ability, ability, and it's, it's absolutely a great question. Yeah, actually, the or mostly accompanying instrument players they all the all the time discuss about the chords, and they know precisely that they, they are not intuitive; they are really analytical. Yes. Yes. And yeah, you write even uh, with like this system about key mobility is that they they don't know the name for particular notes, I would say, but they uh, know designation for, for keys. So they, they do know that this is D minor and this is A minor. And they discuss it. Shall we play in D minor? And they even communicate. So I've noticed like uh, you know, symbol player, someone starts singing and symbol player, ah, it's E flat major, E flat major, guys, E flat major, and uh, still looking for the right key. Ah, E flat major, there we go. So they, are, they do know uh, the assignation for the keys. They do not know the assignation for, for particular notes, but, but uh, they, they know the keys. Yeah, did I answer all the, all the questions? Yes, thank you. Maybe some questions more, if I can. Before all the Roma came into Slovakia in the 15th, 16th century, not as a musician. On the other side, as to the last year, sorry, or we see in the villages there is some suspect against to be a musician, to pay for money. That means it is a long process how it was reconstructed, and how the musicians, not only so I know all Europe, they were there, came to the profession of to make music and to be a professional music. That means to be a professional musician, you have to make all the, uh, the, the steps 
as you have described it, has, but it is also as every music, music has to speak it. Naturally, here it is, it is a special situation because this is a village, and the village has very many robots in separate form with excellent musicians, and that means the young people are, they are living in a musical surrounding. And when Aroma is seeing that his son, maybe son, there are no females, <coughs> uh, he starts to work with them. And that is a long process, as you described, as to beating, but uh, not only beating, <laughs> he is showing how to do his hand. And there is a possibility when he has 12 or 13 years, he can play with them behind, but they play to hear the repertory, indeed to come in to this music. That is a quite special, which is by the, by the uh, white didn't exist such a um, uh, form of learning or, or not so quite uh, conscious. As uh, by the uh, Roman musicians. On the other side, uh, as a publication uh, appeared about uh, 15 years ago about the primarch, very famous, good musicians, what they are playing, how they are playing, how it's, uh, that, that means we are really, as you have done something that is an experimental, trying to find out what is behind this music and how is uh, music. Uh, and the other, other aspect, which from a historical point of view, in Slovakia, after, I would say, after the 1951, 52, 3, where every Roma had to work, not to make music. Many were, uh, uh, were uh, how to say, yeah, were, were to, 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 uh, to not to make music, but to have to, have to work for the society. And that was a time where it's coming uh, up a little that the music is a music. And, but otherwise, uh, there was a need to have folk music and folk dances. It came again slowly, uh, and then after the 1990s, now the revolution class will come, they had not to work, they could have played. And that is a much better job than before to work with, uh, with uh, some meetings. Also. That means social and, and also national things and, and also the consciousness. I'm a Mora, I'm a Roma, I will show what I can. That is also a very, very important part of, of the musical changes. And before all, then came the pop musical scene, where it is all very, very, very easy to come in this uh, uh, musical, how to say, job and to earn money. That means a younger generation have quite other um, uh, uh, interests as in before to make folk music and to, to present, but to earn money as everybody in the, in the society. That means this aspect from social and musical point of view have changed their access to music. And it's a question how the continuity or the discontinuity will uh, go further. So I thank you very much that you have touched this very interesting and very important problem. Please. Just a short remark. Your excellent expression, T mobility, uh, productivity. Uh, explains actually why it is so rare, practically no gypsy vampires. Because of the limitation of the map. <laughs> actually, in 45 years I have found one single uh, Roma vampire in front of the gypsy, who, uh, who was a last member of the gypsy dynasty uh, up to his grand grandfather, Major Vampire. But you hardly don't find any. May I elaborate on it? I think the, the reason uh, why is basically this again, that big pipes are not really good for gaining uh, economic capital, yeah. if you know what I mean. Because big, big pipes are loud, also, right? It's, not really it's, it's good if you go to, to uh, Prague and st stand on, on the Charles Bridge and have a, like a hat and people are, you know, ah, big pipe, 
Otherwise, I think it's, it's kind of a very, um, yeah, not very cool instrument for playing. For uh, that's my theory. Maybe to the last thing, the Coca Cabana Dream is a perfect music. It's one post. I think uh, quite ideal. When I was feeling as I would play at the box, uh, his, his uh, song mm -hmm. this environment. And who was a man when he said, uh, because he says there is a, not a quiet contact. When he was seeing me on a festival, he said, me, Come with me, I will take you to the box, I will pay you, we will get something to eat together. Uh -huh. and was, uh, that means in the last years also the contact between the uh, between the white or other society became an other one. That naturally that is a regard of the political nature to this social economic and one. Sorry, excuse me. I took the mic so no, uh, no more questions, but anyway, uh, just technical remark to what you say about and the reason why, for example, um, Roma musicians don't play bagpipes. And you said your explanation was based uh, on the fact that, uh, from the economic point of view, it was not so interesting. But what would you say, sorry, excuse me, I, I don't need your question, but just for uh, inspiration, what would you say then uh, to the fact that uh, talking about Slovakia, the whole, for the whole 19th century until the beginning of the 20th century, there were many bagpipers who used to live just for uh, for for playing hip pipes at weddings and dancing parties. Excuse me. Maybe it's from that. Right. So the last one. Yeah. <laughs> very short remark, of course, it depends on the repertoire. When the gypsies are expected to play the most popular uh, songs, they cannot do anything with the bagpipe. But uh, as Bella said, and for many countries, we have uh, notice of professional bagpipers because the uh, repertoire was, in the tonal sense, uh, limited. Yeah. So I think this will be a question the music can be answered. Thank you very much. Have a nice